Kids, you are dismissed to go down to your classes. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. We are going to be reading just the last section, the last few verses from Mark chapter 13. And as you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Um, have you ever been caught unprepared before? That ever happened to you? I'm not unprepared now. I am prepared, okay? So this isn't, I am well prepared for what, what is about to happen. But you've been caught unprepared before, right? Um, I remember uh, when I was in my teenage years, I worked at camp every summer. Some of you have done that. And usually, uh, the camp director, who is now my father-in-law, so I think he was picking on me intentionally, but he would come to me and he would say, so at some point during this week, you're going to be called upon to come up, and in front of all the campers, you're going to give your testimony. Done this all the time. Great, no problem. But he never actually told me when it was going to happen. He just said, at some point over the next six days, you're going to be called upon to come up and do something. And for our, those of us that were targeted and told this is what we were going to do, we never knew when the time was coming. We just knew that we had to be prepared, that at any moment we could be called upon. It could happen at any moment. It wasn't for us to know when it was going to take place. It was just our job to be prepared. In our passage this morning, Jesus calls us to be prepared. A day is coming that we must be prepared for, and we don't know when it's going to happen, but we must be prepared. We must stay awake. So in verse 32, Mark chapter 13, verse 32, let me read these verses for us, and then we'll consider what the Lord is telling us to stay awake for. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 32, this is what Holy Scripture says to us today. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please just bow your heads and your hearts with me for a few moments as we go to God in prayer. Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we, we ask that you would help us to read it afresh this morning. Help us to feast afresh on the bread that is your word. May we be fed today through your word, by your word, as your spirit ministers to our hearts. We pray that you would help us to drink deeply of the living water, the living water that is the Son, Jesus himself. We pray that we might be refreshed today because of what your word has for us. Lord, I pray for the churches that are meeting as our brother Luke already prayed. I, I do pray that the word would be heard so clearly this morning that the gospel would be preached and that your people, your church, not just us here, but your church across the world would be refreshed, would be drawn into a, a deeper relationship with you, one that calls us into a deeper faith, a deeper trust, a deeper love, and a more faithful following of you. 
Lord, I pray for the children downstairs. I thank you for them. Thank you that you've given them to us as a gift. We thank you for their laughter, their joy, and yes, Lord, even the noise and the running around that takes place, they are a gift to us, and we give you praise today. We ask that as they hear your word this morning that you would work in their hearts to draw them to yourself. And Lord, for those that do not know you, not just downstairs, but here as well, for any who do not know you, we pray that you would call them to yourself today. We thank you, and we give you all the praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me summarize for you where we were last week, what we, what we looked at, the bulk of chapter 13. There was uh, 31 verses that we tried to chew on and swallow last week, and hopefully, if I can summarize last week, that will help you understand why I decided to tackle verses 32 through 37 on their own. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 13, we saw that Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple. The disciples come out and they're, wow, look at all these wonderful buildings, all these wonderful, marvelous things that Herod has created. And Jesus says, it's all coming down. Not one stone will be left upon another. It's all coming down. And then in verses 3 and 4, we saw the disciples naturally have some questions about that. They ask Jesus when that's going to happen. And Lord, give us a sign. Give us a clue. Help us to understand how we might discern or we might know or we might be able to detect when the temple is going to be destroyed. Then in verses 5 through 31, where we spent most of our time last week, we saw that Jesus is simply answering their question. He's not flip-flopping between topics. Sometimes we get confused and we think that Jesus has switched topics, that he's jumping ahead from answering their question about the destruction of the temple. And we sometimes think that the words that Jesus speaks in verses 5 through 31, he's now jumped ahead to something else and he's talking about his second coming. And we spent some time walking through those verses, hopefully, and I recognized last week and I will still admit this today, there will be some disagreement on that. But I, I hope you could see as we walk through those verses why I think Jesus is simply answering their question. He's warning them against false signs, right? He's exhorting them to endure the harsh persecution that is coming their way. And then he actually gives them a sign in verse 14, the abomination of desolation. And he tells them what to do when they see that sign. As Luke's gospel says, when you see the city of Jerusalem surrounded by armies, what does he tell them to do? Get out. Flee. Don't go back for your cloak. Don't go back into your house to grab anything or pack up. Just get out. He tells them then in verses 24 through 27 that the destruction of the temple is a sign of his enthronement as king of kings. He is exercising his judgment as the Lord of the universe. He is bringing his judgment upon the city of Jerusalem, upon the temple, upon the unrepentant people of Israel. And he's ensuring, he's reassuring them that these things are happening exactly as planned that he is accomplishing his purposes of judgment and salvation. And then he finishes with an exhortation to listen and obey in verses 28 through 31. Just as the fig tree gives out signs that something is near, it gives you an indication, you can predict when summer is near, so too the sign that I've given to you, that's an indication that the temple destruction is about to happen. And you must listen and obey. If you would escape the judgment, you must listen to my words and you must do as I say. Now, why does Jesus give them all of this information? Why does he take the time to walk through all of that? So that they might know. So that they might be on guard, as he says a number of times. So that they might be watching. So that they might be ready for the sign to appear. Lord, when is this going to happen? Give us a sign. Jesus gives them a sign precisely because he wants them to look for it. And Jesus will say something very similar in verses 32 through 37 in our section. Not quite the same, but something very similar. Did you notice the repeated phrase in verses 32 through 37? Look at verse 33. Be on guard, keep awake, 
Verse 35, therefore, stay awake. And verse 37, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. What is Jesus instructing his disciples to do? It's not a trick question. What is, he, what is he saying? Stay awake, right? Don't fall asleep. Stay awake. Be alert. He's exhorting them to be on guard, to be awake, be alert. Always be prepared. That's what he's saying. But, but prepared for what? That's the question, right? Stay awake, but for what purpose? It's easy to think that Jesus is still talking about the same thing that he's still talking about the temple's destruction. And I, I took time last week to show you that there's one consistent theme, one consistent thought in the first 31 verses. But I think there's good reason to see that Jesus has now changed subjects. There's good reason to think that he has changed subjects, topics. He's thinking about something else. He's talking about something else. The first indication that we have that Jesus is, is shifting, he's moving away from temple destruction, and he's talking about something else, is actually in the phrase at the beginning of verse 32, and it's in English, our English phrase, but concerning. It's a little hard to discern in our English translations. It doesn't look all that exceptional to us, but this is a phrase that is often used in the scriptures by authors, by speakers, to indicate a, a shift in conversations. Changing topics now. We were going this way, and now we're going to go in this direction. The greatest example of this is in Paul's epistle, uh, first epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. In that letter, Paul says six, seven times, but concerning, or now concerning. He, he takes a drastic shift from one conversation topic to another. Now concerning, but concerning. So the language that Jesus uses in verse 32 is, is an audio indication for his listeners, I'm changing subjects now. I'm going in a different direction. But there's something else as well. What has Jesus just taken the time to do in verses 5 through 31? He's answering their question, right? What is he doing? He's just explained to them how they can know something, right? He's outlined false signs, don't look for those, and the sign, look for this. He's warned them away and given them the true sign precisely so they can know something, so they can determine when the temple is going to be destroyed, what to look for, what to be on guard for. But what does he say in verse 32? But concerning that day or that hour... No one knows. Do you see that shift, that change? He's moved from something that is known, temple destruction. That's what he was talking about before. Here's how you can know this. And now he's shifted to something else, something they do not know. And he's talking about that day. No one knows that day when that's going to happen. Do you see that shift? Something that is known to something that is not known? The question then is, what is that day? We would tend to think that he's talking about the day that he was talking about in the first 31 verses. But since it's not the temple's destruction, because he's outlined how you can know that, and now he's talking about something that you do not know, what is Jesus talking about? What is he referring to? I mentioned last week that part of our confusion when we come to not just this passage, but many passages in the scriptures, is because we, we don't really know our Bibles as well as we should particularly the Old Testament. Anybody willing to admit they just don't know the Old Testament that well? I put myself in that category, okay? I don't know it as well as I ought. And we just don't read it as much. We don't study it as much. But if we knew our Old Testament better, if we studied, if we paid attention, then we'd be more familiar with certain phrases. Phrases like we saw last week, but phrases also like that day. In the Old Testament... The prophets speak about the day of the Lord's appearing, the day where he arrives, when he arrives to judge and defeat his enemies, the day where he arrives and exacts judgment on his enemies, but also brings great vindication and deliverance of his people. That day of the Lord's arrival is death for his enemies and great joy for his people. And the prophets have a, a shorthand phrase 
to describe the day of the Lord. And that phrase is that day. They just shorten it down to that day. Let me give you one example from Zephaniah chapter 1. You can write that down and go look at it in verses 7 and the verses that follow. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. There's his subject, the day of the Lord. Then he says, on that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their, their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, and on and on and on it goes. That's just one example where the phrase is actually used very closely in, to one another. He is talking about the day of the Lord's arrival. Jesus has already indicated to his disciples that he's changing topics, right? But concerning that phrase that told them that, okay, we're shifting gears here. We're going in a different direction. But Jesus also indicates to them what he's actually talking about now. From the context of the Old Testament, that day is the day of the Lord's appearing. His appearing in judgment and salvation. Those two things that go hand in hand. And if we jump forward in our Bibles to the epistles... We went back to the Old Testament. That gave us the context. If we jump forward to the epistles, we would see that the apostles interpret the day of the Lord's appearing. That day in the Old Testament, they interpret that day as synonymous with the day of Christ's return. They understand that when the day of the Lord, when, when the Lord appears, when he brings judgment, final judgment, and final vindication of his people, that's the same day that Christ comes back. So in other words... Jesus, what is he talking about right now? He's shifted subjects, he's changed topics, and he's now talking about his return. He's now talking about the second advent, the second coming of the Christ. And this is confirmed for us in verse 35, right? Jesus tells a parable. He gives them an illustration to help them understand what he's talking about. And he says that just as no one knows when the master will return... Just, just as the servants don't know when the master's coming back, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. That's what the illustration is. He's helping them understand, you do not know when I will come back. Do you, are you tracking with me? You keeping up with all of this? You see how the shift is from what is known to what is not known? And how we, we see that the Old Testament context, the New Testament context interpretation, verse 35, all of that helps us understand that Jesus is now talking about when he's coming back. You see all that? fitting all that together? The question I have, when I put all those pieces together, my question is, why does Jesus suddenly change topics? Why does he make this sudden shift from temple destruction to second coming? Think about this for a moment. Did you notice in the first 31 verses of chapter 13 that Jesus didn't tell his disciples to stay awake? He said something very similar, be on guard, don't be led astray, but he didn't tell them to stay awake, to be alert. Why do you think that is? I think he doesn't tell them to stay awake because they would naturally be awake, they would naturally be alert looking for that sign. He's just told them, here's the sign, they're obviously naturally going to be staying awake looking for that sign. They're naturally going to be alert looking for the temple's destruction. And I think Jesus is using that momentum, that natural alertness that would have been in their hearts, been in their minds. He's using that natural alertness, that momentum, and he's encouraging them to retain that impulse, that desire to be awake, watching for that sign. Keep that alertness. Keep that same sense of being awake even when there's no sign. Even when there's nothing on the horizon for you to point at and say something great is going to happen now, you don't have that sign, but still be awake. Still be alert. Still be paying attention, even though there's no sign. Because, as we see, there is no sign that precedes his return. There's nothing that indicates he's near. There's no way to predict it. That's why he says in verse 32, no one knows. Look down in verse 32. But concerning that day... Or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. 
Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. This, um, this verse, concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the sun. This verse has often been grabbed onto, latched onto, taken by many false teachers, many heretics, um, and has been used, perhaps not by false teachers, but has been misunderstood by many people, to point to the indication to claim that, that Jesus is not God. If Jesus were God, he would know because God is omniscient, right? God knows all things. And if God knows all things, then Jesus, if he's God, he must know all things. But Jesus just admits, as the son, he, he doesn't know when he's coming back. Therefore, Jesus cannot be God. This verse has definitely caused some confusion. Anybody willing to admit they've been confused by this verse before? I, I have. And, and I think there, it's more than just confusion sometimes. I think sometimes we're, we're a little embarrassed by what Jesus says, right? We're a little embarrassed and we're not quite sure how this fits together, how this works. We don't know how to reconcile the Bible's plain teaching, very clear teaching, as we've seen throughout Mark's gospel, right? Jesus, the Son, is God. He's displayed that over and over and over again in many different ways. And we don't know how to reconcile Jesus as God with his apparent claim to ignorance here in this text. And unfortunately, many of our explanations of this text come at it from a perspective of embarrassment. We're a little ashamed that Jesus would dare say this, and we're, we're trying to fumble over how, how to answer. And perhaps the most popular explanation, there's, there's many explanations that have been given to try to get around what Jesus is saying, but the most popular one, perhaps you've heard of it before, it's the one that I grew up hearing, is that, that Jesus is, the, is, is only speaking in his humanity, right? That Jesus isn't speaking as the divine son of God at this moment, who, who is omniscient, who knows all things. He's simply speaking as the human son, right? The son that was born of the Virgin Mary, who had to learn how to walk, who grew in stature and in favor, who had to learn how to do things and grow just like the rest of us, just like the rest of us human beings. And so the answer that people give is, Jesus isn't speaking in his divinity, he's speaking in his humanity. And the Bible very clearly teaches that Jesus is both truly God and truly man. That he is not half God and half man. That he is not some, some mixture like Hercules where God and man are kind of mashed together. He is both divine and human. And he's the only person in the history of the universe to ever exist with two natures. And these two natures, they, they coexist equally within the Son. The incarnation, the Son takes on human flesh. He takes on a human nature. Perfected, not born in sin, and yet fully, truly human. But we must not mix those two natures together. We must not confuse them. We must keep them distinct in our minds. And yet, when we do that, we recognize that the divine nature of the Son was never hungry. The human nature was hungry when Jesus was hungry and tired. He's hungry and tired in his humanity, not his divinity. And the human nature, the human body that was limited to one place and one time at any given moment while he was on earth, and still now today, his body is only in one place, seated at the right hand of the Father. And yet he knew things and could discern things that no other human being could because he is God, because he is divine. And this is important for us to wrestle with, right? To understand what the Bible teaches about the uniqueness of the two natures of Jesus Christ. We need to understand how they fit together and yet don't get blurred together. And many have wrestled with it, with those principles, the two natures of Christ, and they come to a verse like this with a good and biblical theology that believes that Jesus is the God-man. And they say that if Jesus doesn't know something, well, I know he is both human and divine, then he must be speaking only in his humanity, in his limited incarnate state. Just like God is everywhere all the time, he is omnipresent, but in his humanity, Jesus is only in one place. So 
If he doesn't know something, it must only be his human side that's speaking. That's the standard go-to answer. You've probably heard that before, right? I'm just not convinced that that's the best answer. That may be convincing for you, and if, if it is, that's fine. Don't misunderstand me, though. When I say I'm not convinced, I'm not denying the reality of the two natures. I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't wrestle with that biblical truth that Jesus is both God and man. We need to do that. I'm just not convinced that it's the best answer for this verse because I don't see any distinction made between his divinity and humanity in the text. Jesus doesn't articulate that difference, right? Mark doesn't take the time to say, nor the Son. Now, by the way, this is just Jesus speaking in his humanity. And we don't really do that anywhere else any other time Jesus speaks, right? When Jesus speaks, when Jesus commands, when he talks to people, he talks as the Son that is both God and man. We don't dissect his words on the basis of human and divine nature. Plus, as we've seen all over Mark's gospel, Jesus has displayed a great power and knowledge that can only be explained because of his divinity, right? Because he is God. He's calmed the storms, right? He's cast out demons, he's healed the sick, and he's also what? Even raised the dead. And as he sits teaching, he, he can understand and discern the thoughts, the very hearts of the Pharisees who sit at the back of the room. He knows what they're thinking. He knows what they're mumbling in their minds. How does he do that? How does he know that? Because he's God. Yes, his divinity, his godness, is veiled under the, the human flesh that he takes on. But it's constantly shining through, isn't it? It's constantly shining forth. The disciples got a picture of that at the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Where the, the glory of Christ just shone through, where the veil was peeled back, where they were allowed to see something that is normally veiled under his flesh. And yet as he talks, his divinity, his, his godness is co constantly being displayed. It's constantly shining out. So I'm not convinced that the best answer to this verse is only the human side of Jesus is speaking because I don't see anything in Mark's account that would actually push me in that direction. So if it's not that, if it's not Jesus is speaking as in his human nature, how is it then that Jesus can say that he, the son, does not know something, that he doesn't know when he is going to return? Let, let me back up a little bit, take one step back and ask a slightly different question. And I think this question will help us understand what Jesus is saying here. Why do we not know when Christ is coming back? Why do we not know when the master is going to come? Is it because we're ignorant? Is it because we're not, we're not as smart as we could be? I'm not going to call you stupid, but you know, we, we have some theological deficiencies. We have some theological gaps, some holes in our understanding. We've got limits to what we can know. Is it because we're ignorant? Do we not know because maybe God hasn't revealed it to us? That it's not because we're, we're ignorant, it's because God hasn't told us. He hasn't revealed it. He hasn't shown it to us. Or maybe, maybe we just haven't read enough, right? Maybe we haven't pieced it all together well enough. We just don't know our Bibles as well as we should. I think all of those are true to some extent, right? We do have theological deficiencies. We've got holes in our understanding. We don't read as often as we should. And there are things, there are certain mysteries that God has told us in his word, it's not for you to know, right? All of those things are true to some extent. But what if Jesus isn't speaking about theological deficiencies? What if he's not, he, he's not talking about a, a lack of revelation? This is why I think context is really important. This is why I took the time at the very beginning to remind you of what we saw last week. Remember that Jesus has just taught his disciples how they can know, right? How they can discern, how they can recognize when the temple is going to be destroyed. He gave them a, what? He gave them a sign, right? 
He gave them something that they can point to and say, aha, the temple is going to be destroyed very soon because I see the sign that the Lord has given to us. But now he's speaking about something that they do not know. He's talking about the master's return. And why do they not know when this will happen? Because there is no sign. There's no way to predict when the master will come back. There's nothing you can point to and say, aha, that's when he's going to come back. Only the father knows, Jesus says, because he is the one who determines when it will take place. There's no sign that anyone can point to. No man, no angels, not even the sun. There's nothing that the sun can point to and say, this is when I'm coming back. There's no signs to indicate that the day of the Lord is near. It's not primarily about what's missing up here. It's about what's missing out there. It's not about saying there's deficiencies in here. There's something not out there that you can point to and say it's going to happen. The temple's destruction can be known. There's a sign that you can point to, but his return cannot be known. There is no sign. Do you see the parallels? How Jesus, what can be known because there's a sign, what cannot be known because there is no sign? Are you you're tracking with all of that? The context tells us it's about the lack of a sign, not about the lack of intellectual knowledge. There is no sign, nothing for you to latch onto. You do not know when the master will return. There's nothing you can point to. But even though there's nothing you can point to, even though there's, there's going to be no warning, there's nothing that you can predict, you must still keep awake. That's what he says over and over and over again, doesn't he? Don't fall asleep just because you don't have a sign to look for. Jesus shifts from the natural desire to stay awake looking for a sign, right? There's going to be a sign that I can point to when the temple is going to be destroyed. He shifts from that, that natural desire, to commanding them to retain that same alertness regarding his return. That's the shift. That's where the shift comes in. And he tells them a parable to help them understand why. Look in verse 33. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he, suddenly, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep." What does a doorkeeper do? I mean, this morning I was greeted by a few gentlemen who were uh, shoveling the driveway, and they graciously opened the door for me. A doorkeeper, in the ancient context, didn't just stand there opening the door, right? They actually opened the door, but before they did that, they screened the individual on the other side of the door, right? Right? They did not open the door to anyone who wanted to come in. They, they made sure, they checked in with who was on the other side before they actually let them in. They guarded the door. Do you think it was important for the doorkeeper to stay awake? What happens if, if the cook falls asleep? <laughs> well, food might be burned. Uh, food might be burned. Dinner might be a little bit later getting on the table because the cook took a nap. What happens if the gardener takes a, takes a nap? Perhaps weeds start to grow up. Perhaps, you know, animals like rabbits and squirrels, you know, they get in and they start eating all the fruits and vegetables and the garden's destroyed, the garden's messed up. What happens if the doorkeeper falls asleep? It could quite literally be devastating for the house if the doorkeeper fell asleep. Because if the doorkeeper is asleep, thieves might break in and steal. Vagabonds and ruffians... They might come in and they might not just try to steal things. They might actually try to hurt people. They might try to kidnap people and take them away. I think that's why Jesus uses the illustration of the doorkeeper. Not because we're all meant to be doorkeepers. Jesus isn't saying that we all have the exact same job, right? I think he's telling us that we're all supposed to be awake and alert, just like a doorkeeper must be awake and alert. The doorkeeper, the one who guards the entrance to the house, must always be awake. He's never allowed to take a nap when he's on the job. And he's not just awake for the sake of being awake, right? 
just keeping his eyes open, just for the sake of being there. He's supposed to be awake because he has a job to do. Notice how the master in verse, where am I here? Uh, Verse 34, the master puts his servants in charge, each with his work. Jesus makes sure he points out that each servant has a different job. We don't all have the same job. We don't all have the same gifts. But we must all stay awake. We must all be alert, doing whatever job he's given to us. Let me reiterate that Jesus isn't trying to outline the nature of our work, right? He's not giving a description of what disciples are called to do, not the specifics. He's not pointing out what they are to be doing. He's pointing out how they are to be doing it, what kind of attitude they ought to have. Excuse me. Disciples must be diligent because they know the master could be home at any moment. They must stay awake and stay on the job because he could be pulling in the driveway any second now. And this is what all his servants must be like. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. The inability to predict his return, because there is no sign that we can point to, that must result in alertness. And it's precisely because there is no sign, precisely because you do not know, you must always be ready. You must always be prepared. You must always stay awake. Are you prepared for the return of the king? Are you prepared for the master to come home to his house? Jesus is speaking primarily to his disciples here. But there is a warning that that unbelievers must hear as well. Some of you stand outside the kingdom of Christ. You stand outside the kingdom of the Son of Man. You stand and you fight as a rebel. You have no desire to put yourself under the lordship of God. (coughs) You war and you rage against the rightful rule of God over your life. You love being your own boss. You love this idea that nobody gets to tell you what to do. No government, no spouse, no parents, certainly not God. You think you're free. You think that you're the master of your own fate and the captain of your own soul. It's what you think, but scriptures tell us that's, that's not true. The reality is, is that we're not as free as we think we are, apart from Christ. The Bible describes all those who are apart from Christ as slaves, slaves to sin, We're not free. You are not free. You are bound to the will of your master, bound to do what your master sin wants you to do. And if you remain a rebel, if you continue to refuse to bow the knee to Christ, then you will be crushed as a rebel when the king returns. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, his second letter, He writes this concerning the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord's appearing, that great day when Christ returns. He says, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. This is the end that awaits all who reject Christ. All those who refuse to bow the knee in submission to him, there is nothing but death and destruction. But God does something different with those who do bow the knee, who humbly come before him and submit to his lordship. In the gospel, God promises to forgive all those who repent and believe. All who repent, all who turn away from their sin, who turn away from their rebellion, who turn away from their wickedness, who turn away from their master that is sin, and they put their faith in him, who turn to Christ and believe in him, 
The promise of the gospel is you will be forgiven. And not just forgiven, but welcomed in to the kingdom. Brought in under the lordship of the good and gracious king that is Jesus. He ransoms, he redeems, he restores sinful rebels. Not because they were such worthy opponents, right? Not because they put up a good fight and the Lord has great respect for those who fought well against him. He accepts sinners. He welcomes them into his kingdom solely on the basis of what Christ did on the cross. Some of you may, may remember the hymn, My Hope is in the Lord. Do you know that hymn? Yeah? My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. No merit of my own, his anger to suppress. My only hope is found in Jesus' righteousness. And now for me he stands before the Father's throne. He shows his wounded hands and names me as his own. His grace has planned it all, tis mine but to believe and recognize his work of love and Christ receive. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he freely gives. That, that's the promise of the gospel. When we bow the knee, when we receive that free gift of grace, salvation in the name of Jesus Christ, then we are transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the kingdom of sin, out of the kingdom of man, out of the kingdom of Satan. We are transferred out of that kingdom and we are brought into the kingdom of his marvelous light. We no longer serve sin as our master. We no longer serve self. We now serve the king. We are saved into his service. We are saved to serve him, to worship him him. But this service that we are saved into, it's not a harsh service. It's not a, it's not a difficult or discouraging service. It is a good service because he is a good king. He is unlike any other master. He is a self-giving and self-sacrificing master. This is, this is the kind of master that the, the world cannot understand because he, the master, is the one who steps down off of his throne to serve those that don't deserve it. To serve not just those that don't deserve it, those that hated him and didn't want him as king. And he steps down off the throne and he calls and redeems them. And then once they're brought into the kingdom, he still sits on his throne and yet he continually sustains and serves his people. This is a king, a master, a lord that the world just cannot comprehend. And we serve him now because of what he's done for us. We sing this other song, um, The Servant King. This is our God, the Servant King. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the Servant King. We, we serve him out of love and devotion because of what he's done, because he saved us from sin. And his exhortation to those that he has saved from sin is what? what? What is his call for his disciples that he has brought out of darkness into light? What does he say? Stay awake. Do not grow weary of your work. As you work, wait. And as you wait, keep working. With eager expectation, looking forward to his return. Uh, a number of years ago, Candace sent me a picture while I was at work. And it was a picture of when Amelia was really little. I don't know, like a year and a half, two years old maybe. And I was at work and I got this picture, uh, just the back of Amelia's head as she stood at the front door looking out the window. And the message was she can't wait for dad to get home. There, there was, um, she had no concept of time. She had no idea when I was coming back. I don't even remember at what point in the day it was. There was, there was going to be no sign. I wasn't going to call Amelia. I wasn't going to text Amelia. There was going to be no, no letter that was sent, no email, no postcard. Nothing was coming that was going to alert her when dad was on his way home. All she knew is she couldn't wait for daddy to get home. So she stood with eager expectation, waiting and watching. 
We do not know when the Lord Jesus is coming back. There's no sign that tells us when he's right around the corner. Therefore, we must remain vigilant. We must always be prepared for his return. We must continue to work as we wait. Are you prepared for his return? Have you submitted yourself to him by faith? You must be ready. You must be awake. Because every day that passes, every moment that passes by, every second that goes by in our life brings us one moment, one day, one second closer to his return. We must be awake. Let's pray. Lord, we hear your call this morning, the call that you gave to your disciples as they sat on the Mount of Olives listening to you teach them about the temple's destruction. We, we hear your exhortation to them to stay awake, to be alert, to be ready. And Lord, we ask for your help. And Lord, we we pray. We pray with eager expectation the words of the hymn that says, And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Lord, we await with eager expectation and we pray now with the final words of Scripture, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Would you please stand as we close our service this morning with a hymn. Join us as we sing hymn number 176, Be Thou My Vision. Let me just remind you of a few things that are going on in the life of our 
our church. Uh, next week, young adults, we have our meeting uh, in the afternoon. We'll be meeting up in Newmarket, going skating, and then back to our place for some food. Uh, on the last Saturday of January, men will be having a breakfast here at the church downstairs. Um, Luke, do you want help? <laughs> He's okay. Uh, so please just sign up. There's a sign-up sheet at the back. Um, please make sure men to uh, come and spend some time in, in fellowship there. In a couple of weeks, uh, we will be having a members meeting, February 4th, 4th, February 4th. So members, please put that in your calendar and make sure that you are here as we go over our, um, our finances, setting our budget for this fiscal year. There's other stuff in the bulletin. Please make sure you look at that. For now, let me uh, close our time in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the ways that you continue to provide for us, your people, as needy as we are. We thank you that you are indeed our great shepherd. You lead us spiritually beside quiet waters, and you lead us physically, Lord, where we ought to go. We pray that you would help us to understand and discern, help us to be wise in this world, and help us to take the food of the gospel. Help us to take that this week, Lord and to share it with those that so desperately need it. Prompt us, we pray. Find us faithful. Encourage our hearts. Embolden us, we pray, for the sake of our Savior, for the sake of the gospel, and for the sake of your name. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.